I, I think we have a, a microphone, so maybe if you can raise your hand and wait for the microphone to get to you before you ask your question. Fine. Um, you do pre-write and literature and short stories. Uh, what's the difference between, uh, I mean, have you ever thought about mixing, uh, mixing two different forms of literature together? Um, yeah, that's my question. Uh, like maybe mix a playwright with a short story, like uh, maybe same uh, use the same uh, writing technique or style. Yeah, I the only experiment I've done is you know use, use orality. My novel Matigari is really was almost an experimentation in um, oral storytelling, but in, in a written form. I you know the, 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 the Matigari is a very simple story, but it's got the repetitiveness of, a, you know, a, an oral tale, and you know, an oral tale often has what we call origin, also has drama in it, has music in it, you know. Uh, so I tried to all those elements in uh, the narration of uh, Matigari. You know. But otherwise, I'm not. Otherwise, I uh, the, again when you're writing writing a play, you know, like the one which is a play which has not been well, the one which if you like was the one which forced me to exile. Play my first play in a good language, I'll marry when I want. I'll marry when I want. Like that, dead forced me into prison for a whole year. The one he was referring to. My next play, the Koyo, mother sing for me, my Toby Gera forced me to exile. <laughs> so, I have a special relationship to theatre. <laughs> and um, I'm, not, I'm not written a play recently because I don't know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah, but in a play, theatre, you can really have different, you know, sort of. Um, uh, genres into a very particular music, you know, uh, and little narrations within that. Uh, in a novel, particularly when you draw from on Orich again, you can also have interesting sort of stories within stories, yeah. And of course, you can also have a poem or two <laughs> in the novel. Hi, um, you've written about translation as restoration, in that um, in, in, in the idea of translating works by African writers into uh, by African writers writing in English or French back into um, African languages, and then Mukoma, you talked about translation between African languages. I want to know what's happening um, in in terms of these ideas. What, what, what kind of what kind of translation is going on today? Um, I, in terms of between African languages, yeah. you know, um, I've done little. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, I've done a few poems, um, but in terms of actual work being done, uh, unless I'm wrong, I haven't seen much. Um, you know, because there's there's a real question of, you know, as Papa was saying, there's a real question of. Um, of, uh, of support, whether it's from the government, but also from publishing, mm -hmm. you know, from publishing companies. It's one thing to tell them that, you know, uh, I want to translate something from English into 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 Kikuyu or Kiswahili. You know, that's one thing that you still have to fight. But I think to tell them, you know, now let's translate between Basato poetry and, and you know and Kikuyu and Kikuyu poetry. No, so as far as I know, not much has been done. But once again, it boils down to the place of African languages in the African continent, in African countries. You know. So there is a kind of vicious circle, you know, uh, negative policies, educational ones. Therefore, very few publishers also, you know, venture into that area. Therefore, very few readers. So one thing feeds into the next, into a kind of vicious circle. Which you know has to be broken somewhere, and we try to break it. You know, uh, and 
there are a few good things which are happening, by the way. It's not just negative, by the way. It's many good things are happening. For in Kiswahili, there's a whole body of translations into Kiswahili from all the... Most of the major African writers are now in Kiswahili, by the way. So, there's, you know, glimmers of hope there and there. But I was saying that if, in a situation where African languages are in use, it's not only a question of writing new works in African languages, which will be good, but we can also have a very interesting uh, process of uh, translating works which have been written by African writers in English or French back into uh, African languages without interfering with their individuality as works which were written in English. It's a kind of restoration, because a lot of these novels and poems by African writers really drove very heavily, seriously, on African orature. So restoration is a kind of restoration, really, to African languages. Then you can also have a very interesting dimension of translation, quite translation. You know, the African uh, diasporic you know, literature, that whole vast literature, you know, we need names like, you know, uh, Langston Hughes and other the, the everyday names in the lips of African kids, you know, uh, uh, and then world literature, whether it's English or French, into African languages, you know. So what I'm trying to argue is that, in fact, potentiality of African is huge, it's huge, uh, but there has to be a fundamental change towards the languages, you know. We have to find a way of breaking this vicious circle where everything feeds into each other to work against African languages. But if it's a question of development of African language, it can be done either through writing originally in those languages, but also translation. I really think translation is a very, very important tool which will be used actually. It's only by the it's only religious organizations, they are the only ones who need to know the real value of translation. You know, uh, without the Bible, many African languages would have died by now. Mm. But the people in the people, people in the Bible, they believe in so much that they make sure it's available in as many mm. languages as possible. Yeah. yeah and the, the, there was a question just briefly that was raised by Obi Wali in a 1962 conference. Uh, which was whether if you have uh, African literature in, uh, in African languages, so let's say writers are writing in African languages, what about criticism? Mm -hmm. You know, because then if you figure that uh, criticism and, and, and the literature, they're sort of symbiotic, right? So and his argument was that, yeah, critics also need to pick up the, the language debate. And there's one example of Kimani Jogu, you know, who has written a, a literary theory, a literary theory book in Kiswahili. So, so I mean, there's, 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 the work is that we just need to build on it. In the same way that we need to build on an existing resource, which is that most uh, most people, for example, in Kenya, you know, speak more than two or three languages. You know, so so the potential is there, uh, but we need you know either universities and high schools and so on and so forth to to do to make translation a center or at least part of the curriculum. So I think we only have a few minutes, so maybe if we can keep the questions. Sure, and, uh, and I'll try to keep the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering, in the translation of your writings, has there ever been a word you just haven't found an English counterpart for? Oh, oh, oh yeah, there are. Uh, first of all, all languages, by the way, have their. It's what I find fascinating about languages. By the way, I have to say this about, this about languages. That I said, there's nothing wrong with the English or French or Italian. What's wrong with the language situation is their hierarchical relationship. Mm -hmm. Each person wants to think that their language is somehow better, has more power than other languages. And what we need is to collapse that relation between languages in terms of hierarchy, but more in terms of a network, with network you give and take and translation obviously enables that, you know. As 
every language has certain words, certain ways of saying things which are very difficult to put into another language. Yeah, every language has those peculiarities. Yeah. Yeah. There's one word that you used to give me this example of a. Uh, of Godera, which means clean, but it's also philosophically is it opaqueness where where you can see through where you can see through uh, yeah. yeah you know so so that's one word that's difficult you know but in translation theory you it, such words would always exist so as a translator you have to decide you know do you want to use multiple sentences to describe that do you want to keep the word so the reader feels the you know feels the original original language in the translation uh, or do you want to completely figure, you know, let's say fast food in Kenya is nyamachoma, roast meat, and then consequently in the US it will be McDonald's in the <laughs> translation. <laughs> yes. so, so there are all sorts of questions one can weigh. <laughs> okay, next question. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you, considering colonialism, decolonization, um, exile, academics, and now I want to add uh, crime fiction. <laughs> Would you consider yourselves transnational authors? Oh, no, me I'm not transnational. I'm Kenyan. My <laughs> 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 um, language writer. <laughs> yeah, no, but myself, I, I think that you know it's it's a huge debate. You know, because the question is, can you exist without roots? Yeah. You know, so can you be transnational? Can you be universal with, without without roots? Um, and, and my answer is not quite, but I do think that one can claim, you know, for example, I have no problem claiming my Kenyanness and also claiming my, you know, I say this with a little bit of shakes, you know, Americanness, you know, <laughs> you know, you know but I, I do think you can say I'm from two or three different, you know, cultures and, and places and, you know, so, but I, don't, but I don't think that necessarily translates into transnational. It's the same difference, I argue, there's a difference between, uh, you know, a cosmopolitan and world citizen. I think world citizen, even though they, they're supposed to mean the same thing, I think world citizen means that that person, wherever they land, they'll fight for their rights and so on and so forth. Whereas cosmopolitan, to me, is, is, is more abstract. Hi, Abbas Yasanti Sana. I'm going to ask you a question. 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 Kwa sababu kuna watu wengi hapa ambao hawajui Kiswahili. Eh? Asante sana kwa swali lako lakini kwa sababu watu wengi hapa hawajui Kiswahili eh? tutaongea kwa lugha ya He was asking you ask whether I've read any English from Kenya correct? Yeah, Yeah. Is that what I've read uh, literally every interview from Kenya and what I like and so on, you know. Uh, and he was asking Kiswahili. He speaks very beautiful Kiswahili. <laughs> Asante sana. And he made it. So, see, it can be done. Huh? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, Mukoma yeah. has books I've read, you know, but, yeah. but also uh, I think it's a young man called Mwangi Vinyanga Wainaina. He's actually a very interesting um, uh, autobiography or memoir. One day I write about this, you know, or something like that. You know, it's really very very fascinating. It was written uh, almost as if he's speaking it out. You know, he makes you. As a reader, he draws you into the drama of his life. So it's as it unfolds, he feels that you, you know, you are unfolding with it as it were. You know, uh, that I find very, very, you know, uh, uh, fascinating. So a lot of good things are coming. But on cosmopolitanism, let me say this: younger writers, what I find generally, whether I'm talking about English or French or. Younger writers, you know, like how uh, was the name again? This young lady. No, yeah. no, 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 no,
please their world in a way that helps them cross uh, across cultures and countries much more freely, I think, you know, than probably in uh, uh, my generation, who are very clear, <coughs> just colonized and colonized. <laughs> we grew up in that kind of, within that kind of world where there was colonizer, colonizer and anti-colonial, we were always aware of that. But the new generation, it's a very good thing because of the, the world in which they are, they are inheriting, a kind of a more globalized world, you know, they travel more. This, you know, so this is reflected obviously uh, in their work. I don't talk about my son's work, but what's very, very interesting about this book and what everybody's commenting upon, and very, very fascinating, uh, I taught in my class at Darwin, and what they drew up is this, uh, they, what they, they what fascinated them was this, uh, this, uh, this, the two characters, the two main characters are one is African detective, the other is African American. And the exploration of the dynamics, but this has not been done before. You know, so it opens new territories, new ways of looking at uh, Africa, African, African, African American relationship. I mean, it's, it's very complex, but within a thriller mystery detective structure, yeah. Um, so we, we have just time for one more question. Can, can, I, can I just a quick, um, in terms of, um, of Nairobi Heat, you know, I've read it and I quite enjoyed it. We <laughs> 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 recommend it. Yeah, I recommend it. <laughs> and, and since his books are not here. <laughs> uh, but um, in, in terms of one of the books I've read lately, it's called um, Tales of Kasaya. It's by Iba Kasaya, right? And it's written by a housemaid. You know, she, she's a former housemaid. She's a, if you're familiar with the housemaids, they're the most um, exploited people uh, in, in the Kenyan, you know, Kenyan labor system. And usually, even we who you know write, you know, politically, we will have a maid character who is on, you know, on, on the margins, right? You know. So for me, I'm finding very, very fascinating in that now it's is this character. Well, I mean, I, I'm calling her a character who has been marginal. Uh, even in even in uh, in books for those who are fighting for her, and now it's uh, essentially giving us her worldview, and then it's brilliantly 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 uh, written. Um, at the same time, it does raise questions of how far Kenya has come. You know, if you're if you're talking from the middle class perspective and from the upper class perspective, yes, it has come a long way. But if you're talking about from our perspective, it actually does read almost like something that would have been written in the colonial times. But it's brilliantly written, so that one I would definitely recommend. Mm -hmm. So, um, hello, and I'm, we are, I'm very honored to be in your presence. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And it's wonderful to hear the stories of your family and how literature has been so important to you. I have one comment and a question, and maybe you can give me your thoughts. One of the questions I have, or the comment, is more around language. You said uh, quite uh, some interesting things around language and the hierarchy in language. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia, where we have over 80 languages spoken in a space that's so small, like the size of Texas. Mm -hmm. So in the hierarchy of languages, we need a language that actually more people can understand, even when literature is written for the people there. So. It's just something that I was thinking about. There is a common language that is dominant in our own language, in our own country, that is used to to, to share the, the literature amongst Amharic. most of the people. Amharic? Amharic, yes. Okay. And uh, so I'm wondering if English has been used just as a medium to be able to reach more people within the African diaspora and within the African continent uh, so it's just something that I was thinking about, maybe you can comment, but I'd like to ask you a question uh, before I can give up my microphone. <laughs> um, in African languages, most there is a lot of emphasis in, in intonation, in body language, in how things are said. Words change meaning. And what are your thoughts about audiobooks? 
And, and I would right. just like to say, maybe we can just focus on that question, because the first question you asked is really quite a big question. And I want to be respectful. This, this museum closes at 5. Um, so maybe we can just quickly answer that question, and then there'll be book signings. There'll be a little bit more time when you can talk around that. Um. In, to address the first question, sorry, but I'm not going to be really brief. You know, I think I'm kind of bossy, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I agree with linguists argue that all languages are equal. And I think, you know, that's, that's a position we should move from that. You know, that should be the principle, and then the other things can become a matter of policy and practicality. Um, yeah. um, in terms of audio books, yes, I, 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 I do think that. Um, you know, this is a big question, you know, that we are discussing with James Ali, actually. In terms of what's the role, you know, what's the role of technology uh, you know, in, in contemporary African literature, what is it going to be? And I agree, I, I think audio books would be, you know, certainly they should be there. You know, there's a time I was uh, talking with, um, with my editor in South Africa, and he was saying, for him, he has this goal of, of people come, you know, and, um, you know, they come listen to the writer, you know, in a stadium or whatever, you know. <laughs> Uh, and then as they leave, he sees them, you know, opening their fonts and stuff, you know, to look up the author, but also to read their work. In, in other words, making the books available in as many media as possible. Yeah. But well, I can respond just, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll this time will be very, very brief, you know. Uh, of languages need to be seen as a yeah, particularity, you know, each language has something to give, and in that sense, there's no language bigger or smaller than another, you know. But then we come to use. Of course, if this was recognized, there's nothing wrong in one or two languages also being languages that help, you know, uh, whether it be English or Amharic, Kiswahili. Like I'm very proud to be a Kiswahili in Kenya, for instance, you know. So the way I put it this way, use English or European languages or whichever language to enable and not disable. So you just carry through a enable and not disable. In other words, you don't English just now is used to what enables enables visibility. It disables those interest because it takes them out of. But the way you can use English to enable conversation without disabling. Yeah. So enable and not disable, or enable without disabling, disabling. So I'm not disabling, but I think that's a lovely <laughs> 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 end. Well, right. well, 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 well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I want to thank all three of you. Thank you, Anguia, and Mokoma, and Sarah for being here today. And thank you, Litquake, for bringing this here to the Museum of the African Diaspora. Um, if you like what you see, come back and see us again, become a member, support us, and turn in your evaluation. There are copies of Nairobi Heat downstairs. You can go purchase them and bring them back up to be signed. Thank you very much for coming today.